All right. So what we are going to do today is continue looking in a little bit more detail into the implementation using Vivado HLS. I will be looking at some of the reports as well as trying to understand what are the different parts of the uh, and how do we understand the synthesis report, the timing report, the core simulation, the waveforms that are generated as a result of that. All of those factors we will look very briefly at. Uh, I had also started briefly to talk about how peripherals in general are accessed using a memory mapped interface. We will go over that part as well. Over the next couple of days we will be completing all of this as well as giving you a demonstration of two of the sample projects that you can take up. Okay, uh, One of them like I said is implementation of a neural network using a basic library. The second is an implementation of a OFDM communication system. Uh, many of the MTech students uh, currently working on uh, the 5G project are already, they have gone through this process already. Uh, those of you who are interested in continuing your projects in this area, that is basically looking at some kind of hardware implementation, uh, can look into that project. Having said that, there is no compulsion that you take up that project for this course. You can take up something else as well and if you are interested in doing the project, depending on how you are able to perform in this course, you can of course continue uh, doing a project in that area. So both of those will be discussed in more detail on Friday. Uh, today what I am going to do is look uh, dive a little bit deeper into the HLS results itself, how to understand it, how to implement it and also essentially tell you what assignment 4 is. So just as a reminder, the midterm exam is over, the short quizzes will continue, there isn't one today but we will be having more uh, moving forward. The assignments and the project are going to be a large part of your overall grade. right? Uh, three assignments are already completed. We'll be sort of giving you the grading and the feedback for that soon. But assignments will continue. Even though you are starting on the project, there will be other assignments that you need to do. The assignments will be sort of more focused, more specific. In this case, the fourth assignment is basically going to be an extension of assignment three. You have already taken your FFT code for the 1024 point FFT and you were able to convert it into fixed point using the AP fixed library. The next step is going to be to synthesize it and optimize. What I mean by optimize is you now need to go through the process of reducing the number of clock cycles that it takes and possibly also optimizing the amount of hardware that it takes. Right? These assignments by their very nature are not closed ended. You do not have one specific pass fail result. Right? In general in design there is no single pass fail result. What you do have is a variety of options. So how the assignment is going to be graded is finally fundamentally based on correctness. Is your design synthesizing properly? Is it meeting all the requirements? And after that we'll be given some additional marks based on how optimal is it? Is it running fast or is it small or are there any other optimizations that you were able to bring into the design process? Okay. So those things will be explained uh, later as we give the assignment but broadly so, uh, so that you can get started on assignment 4 it is going to involve taking assignment 3 which is your fixed point 1024 point FFT and synthesizing it, uh, getting the output results and also running the co-simulation and verifying that everything works after synthesis as well. So what do those steps mean right? So what we are going to look at basically is HLS results analysis right the timing as well as resources briefly look at the synthesized Verilog and also look at what co-simulation means okay so let's get started I am going to pick up where we left off last time. The code that we had for the FFT, as I mentioned earlier, was, you know, I had shown you this code briefly, but on the other hand, all of you have your own versions of the code, so you don't need to really use this. This is just one sample. It's for a 32 point FFT. This has been written pretty much following exactly the stage by stage, you know, uh, block diagram that you would come across in any textbook on signal processing for the FFT algorithm. right? 
so it's a 32 point f50 therefore there are five stages there is also one stage for bit reversal we went through the synthesis process and the numbers that we saw were basically this right there is an the interval was 511 clock cycles and the latency was also 511 clock cycles in other words you give the input you wait for a certain amount of uh, time for everything to complete right and after that is when you can give the next set of inputs okay we will look at that in a little bit more detail as we move forward before that i just wanted to also talk in a bit more detail we had already looked at this the group fft that block was taking around 80 clock cycles there are five such blocks that's around 400 405 clock cycles and one loop for the bit reversal which was taking 96 clock cycles right so there are a few things that you can look at over here one of them is this thing that basically says this is the trip count right the trip count of any loop in general is simply going to be the number of times the for loop executes so in this case for i is equal to 0 up to n n is 32 therefore the trip count of this bit reversal loop is 32 right this thing pipelined right now it says no okay this is something that we will get into later i'm not going to talk about it now but it should be obvious to you and by now that there is something called pipelining that you can do over there which hopefully should give you some speed up okay but i don't want to get into that right now because that is one of the optimizations that we are going to be looking at it probably requires a little bit more time to spend on it and understand when you can do pipelining when you cannot and so on okay uh, the latency of the loop is basically three and in this case so one way of looking at what it means when it says not pipelined is it does not say anything about the initiation interval of the loop okay there is no concept of initiation interval the loop starts it has to finish and the next iteration of the loop will start after that so then there is only a concept of a latency right the loop takes three clock cycles to finish and you can sort of understand why there is one read operation some computation and a write operation involved that itself is sufficient to take three clock cycles okay multiplied by 32 it gives you a total latency for the loop of 96 in the same way you can do the analysis for the rest of the computations as well and you know you roughly you come up with this number saying that the final uh, interval and latency for the overall fft is 500 clock cycles what about the resource usage no block rams kind of interesting there are after all you have declared a whole lot of arrays in your code but it finally has inferred that no block rams were required in order to implement this okay why does that happen to understand that you probably need to look a little bit more closely at the generated verilog code right but broadly you can think of it this way the way that the code has been written pretty much each stage is just generating output which is then being fed into the next stage you don't need a separate block ram in order to store the data right the assumption that you have over here is you have some external memory which has an interface to your fft module right and effectively speaking what is going to happen is i'm going to read data from the fft module uh, from the memory do some computation write it back into that memory so in other words this is sort of doing an in place computation right just this one memory block alone is sufficient no additional memory is needed okay what about the number of uh, dsp 48e right what is a dsp 48e broadly speaking it's a multiplier okay so at the in simplest possible terms that you can just think of it as a multiplier so why four multipliers we can actually go a bit further and sort of try and find out what are the expressions that you have over here or uh, yeah the dsp 48s interestingly it says there are no dsp 48s that's because it's saying that at the top level no dsp 48s are being used right if you want to know where the dsp 48 is actually being used you have to go inside the fft block once you go in there it says this one is again using four dsp 48s and it tells you exactly where it's being used right 
So there is one I0 plus I1, I2, another I0 minus I1, I2, I0 into I1. There are like four expressions over here, which you can probably connect back to the original code. Okay. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is these are complex multiplications we are talking about. So one multiply operation that we use in our C code will translate into more than one multiplication operation in hardware. Okay. I leave it to you to do the exact sort of correlation and find out whether this number four makes sense or not. Okay. So, but apart from that, of course, the rest of it looks good. Essentially what it's saying is four DSP slices were used. So if we assume that one complex multiplication involves four hardware multipliers, then we are okay. No block RAMs were used. Number of flip flops and number of lookup tables, we really don't know whether uh, there's no simple way of saying whether this is a reasonable number or not. Okay, you probably could do some analysis mostly based on the fact that you know you can now go into the different instances, find out that a single instance of the FFT0 block is using 490 lookup tables and 700, uh, 490 flip flops and 799 lookup tables. But more importantly, you can also see over here that where 325 of the top level flip flops are being used. Right? Effectively, what it's saying is that even though we are doing this kind of in-place computation where we keep writing data back into the main memory, there are some registers that are required to hold the computed values. Each of those is 32 flip-flops wide. And as a result, the final thing that ends up taking 320 flip-flops, there is also five flip-flops required for that bit reversal addressing. Right? So, for a large part, you can actually correlate every number that you have over here with what you have written in your C code. And I would strongly encourage you to do that in all cases, right? Don't get into the habit of click a button, just report the number that you get from there. You have to be able to explain why those numbers make sense. Otherwise, there's no point in using this tool for design. Okay. so. All of this is fine. The interesting thing is it's finally telling you that, you know, it was able to synthesize the code, right? We already know that the C simulation can be run, right? The C simulation would essentially involve running this test bench, right? So what the C simulation, if you look at it, it would read in data from FFT file uh, data in uh, cpp.txt, compute the FFT, take the result into a variable into an array called data underscore out, read the expected output from FFT file out, that is data out dot text, and then do a comparison between these two, right? To check whether they are within some tolerance limits, right? That's what the test bench is going to do. So if I run the test bench, what I will see is, it will basically go through a process of compiling my test bench, compiling the C code. This is all C, there is no hardware at all involved anywhere in this, right? End result is CSIM done with zero errors. That's the important part over here. Okay. How did it decide that zero errors were there? Because after all, we did not print out any number of errors, right? We just sort of exited without printing anything. The assumption is that you are going to write your code in such a way that if there is an error, the number of errors is what you will be returning as the result of your test bench, right? So this return result, if you return any non-zero value, it will basically say that many errors were found. So it's up to you to see whether that makes sense or not. Okay. Once you have done all of that, you can do something called C slash RTL co-simulation. Okay. So before we get into that, let's just quickly look at what the synthesis results look like. Right. The synthesized output, which you can find on the left hand side corner over here. It has multiple things. One is, of course, the reports, which are pretty much just text format of whatever this is showing over here, right? It also generates outputs in different languages. System C, Verilog, and VHDL. Okay? I am most familiar with Verilog. Therefore, I am going to look at the Verilog code. If you look at it, what it has done is it has taken your FFT function and generated a whole lot of Verilog files corresponding to that. Okay? If you look more closely at it, you will see that essentially there are some small files over here. For example, this is an FFT underscore mul. And if you look at the module itself, all that it's saying is it takes two inputs A and B. 
one is a uh, 16 bit input the other is a 10 bit input and the output is going to be a 24 bit output okay so it's assuming that those are signed inputs 16 bit signed into uh, 10 bit signed effectively the range of numbers that you have is 15 and 9 bits so therefore 24 bit result is what you're going to get okay what does it do it directly actually instantiates a multiplier okay so a lot of this code is hard to really understand in detail you don't want to make too much sense of it but what you can do over here is look at the top level FFT block you can already see all the interface signals the clock reset start done idle ready they are all present here the signals for reading in from the outside world the data is present and writing out back to the outside world is also present these parameters as you can sort of guess are used because there is some kind of a finite state machine being implemented inside this FFT module remember what I said about how in general a data path plus control is implemented the data path consists of the computational units the multiplier the adder etc and the control essentially is a set of select signals for multiplexers and those control signals are generated by means of some kind of a finite state machine okay what this is effectively telling you is there is a finite state machine inside this top level FFT block in this case it has 13 states if you look at the numbers on the right hand side of this expression you will see that it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 etc what kind of FSM encoding does that mean? You remember? yeah it's basically what's called one hot encoding right? so essentially using one bit to indicate a state so in other words it will use 13 registers 13 flip-flops in order to hold the state value at any given time only one of them will be on what's the advantage of one hot encoding decoding which state you are in is very fast and very easy there's only one flip-flop that is going to be active all the others are zero so you can just use that as a select signal to determine what outputs are being generated what's the disadvantage of one hot encoding the number of flip-flops that you use right but on FPGAs flip-flops are plentiful Right? the number of flip-flops that you have on an FPGA compared to what you would get on an ASIC for a given amount of logic FPGAs are very rich in flip-flops so you will typically see things of this sort Right, there will be a lot of buffers there will be a lot of small flip-flops there will be a lot of finite state machines with one hot encoding things that you would not normally implement in ASIC designs Okay, that is one of the sort of differentiating things that you need to keep in mind when you are writing code for an FPGA versus for ASIC in our case we don't care too much about it hardware as long as we get working hardware that's all right the details of which way to implement it we can think about that later go further down it's hard to understand this code it was never meant to be read by human beings on the other hand there are parts of it that you can make out what's going on right so there are blocks over here that basically look like memory blocks you can clearly make out that they are going to hold temporary values and so on the FFT0 block is ultimately one big instance that you have over there apart from that you have all of this tiny combinational logic that basically looks at the state and looks at some values and then says done becomes one or idle becomes one ready the select signals right the CE values address values all of those are changed based on, based on the state that you are in and some other conditions okay so the entire sort of logic that you would need for the state machine is visible over here not easy to understand but in the worst case if it comes down to it and you need to debug at this level you can do it okay fine but that's not really what we would like to do in general what we would like is can we have some kind of simple confirmation that the Verilog that got generated actually does what we wanted it to do okay now this is something called equivalence checking in the general case equivalence checking says that I have two versions of a design I need to check whether they are doing exactly the same thing okay and think about it it is not at all obvious that that is actually happening because what you had originally was there was a C code now what you have is a very log code what proof do you have that they are actually both doing the same thing except for the fact that Xilinx basically gave you some assurance that you know their compiler works right 
the unfortunate part is there can be situations where the compiler has bugs in it and actually generates Verilog code that does not work the way that you expect. Okay, So there are multiple ways of doing this kind of equivalence checking. There is one method called formal equivalence checking, right? which essentially says there are formal methods by which you can literally say you have the C code, these are the set of transformations that were impl employed by the compiler in order to convert that into Verilog. And by going through that process, you can literally say that this line of Verilog corresponds to this input line of C and therefore they are exactly functionally equivalent. Whatever the C code does is exactly what the Verilog code will do. In general, that's very hard to implement. We do not have such formal equivalence checking implemented over here. What they do provide on the other hand, which is much simpler to implement is functional equivalence checking. Right? What that means is you already have a test bench. Why not run that same test bench against the generated Verilog code and see whether the same results come out. Right? As you can imagine, that's not bulletproof. There can be situations where your test bench was incomplete. You did not really test for some corner cases. And therefore, you miss out on some situation where the Verilog code is actually wrong. Right? But provided that you have done your homework and you have got the test bench fairly comprehensive, then you can say that yes, you know, whatever was generated by the C code and whatever was generated by the Verilog code, they match. Therefore, the Verilog code does what the C code was supposed to do. They are equivalent. Okay. That is where this whole business of C and RTL co-simulation comes into the picture. Right. So if you click on this, what you get is you can select the type of simulator you want. You can also select which RTL, whether you want to use the Verilog or the VHDL model. It should not make any difference because both are supposed to be exactly the same code. right? If they ever give you a different result, then it means there is a serious bug in the compiler somewhere. right? So hopefully that should never happen. One interesting thing that you should try is the default over here for this dump trace is set to none. okay? But you can change it to all and compile it. okay? You just click on OK, it will run. Now I'm not going to do that because it takes some amount of time. I have already run it, right? Therefore, I will just show you the final result. If you have selected this dump trace and set it to all and it successfully passes through the entire compilation process, what you will see as a result is that actually, so what will happen is there will be one simulation report over here called FFT COSIM, which finally comes up with this set of values over here, right? What it is saying is it did the co-simulation and as a result of doing that, it was able to find out that the actual measured latency was 511 clock cycles, measured interval between successive inputs was 512 clock cycles. Okay, So this is a case where the interval is one more. Effectively, what it's saying is you have to wait for the complete latency, then wait one clock cycle and then give the next set of inputs. Right? Fine. So this is a number that you have. What's even more interesting is if you actually open this wave viewer, right? So this is another one of those tiny buttons with some green squiggles on it at the top. When you open this, you actually see that the complete waveform of what is the input that was generated, what is the input that was provided to your Verilog code and what is the output that was generated as a result. Okay. Now, this is interesting. If you think about what is happening over here, what Xilinx has done, what the tool has done for you is it took your C code test bench and your Verilog code that was generated, the FFT block that was generated as Verilog code, whatever arrays that you were passing into the Verilog code, it created an equivalent interface module which allows the Verilog code to retrieve the data coming from C one clock cycle at a time. So it effectively implements a memory interface between your C code and your Verilog code. right? This is not as trivial as it sounds at first because C has no notion of a clock. There is no concept of time in the C code that you write. Whereas the Verilog code fundamentally has to work only with a clock. Okay. So all that is taken care of and what you see once you do this is Unfortunately, that's not really readable. So I would suggest you go back and run this on your own. I will expand these signals for you. At least once you expand it, you will get a better picture of what's going on. 
this top level over here is something that says design top signals okay so let's open that and let's see what is there the first one over here is the c outputs then the c inputs block level io handshake reset and clock okay let's start by looking at the clock it's nothing fancy it's just basically a clock it's a square wave right the only interesting thing about it is if you look at those numbers in the on the top over there which again unfortunately are not readable in this case it says 1005000 so it's basically telling you that it's 1 million and 5 picoseconds or 1005 nanoseconds okay the interesting thing is as you sort of step forward over there you will see that it steps goes in steps of 5 nanoseconds at a time the reason for this is while doing the synthesis you had specified a 10 nanosecond clock period automatically vivado hls uses 10 as the target clock period for your synthesis and implementation okay good so all that means is it's using the right clock what's it doing with the reset signal let's zoom out fully over here you will see that there is just one tiny bit in the corner out here where the reset is equal to 1 right so within around 100 nanoseconds or so right by the time you reach around 100 120 nanoseconds the reset has already gone high and then gone low okay this is an active high reset so during the time that it is high the module that you generated is being reset why is it for 100 nanoseconds that's just some standard that they use okay they want to make sure that if at all there is some kind of a synchronous reset that requires multiple clock cycles everything will get reset properly okay again you don't need to worry about this now let's look at the c inputs this is interesting effectively what it's telling you is what this is showing you is the data underscore in which is a memory interface okay you can see that there are a lot of these yellow up and down squiggles that you see over here correspond to when the chip enable signal going out to the memory block right so there is a data in address and a data in data coming back right for the other one there would be a data out address A data out data going in this direction and a data out right enable right in the case of read there would also be a data in chip enable similarly there would be a data out chip enable as well that goes out over here okay so those are the signals that we see so this highlighted line over here essentially corresponds to the data in chip enable there are separate signals for imaginary and real that's because the complex value is basically treated as two memory ports in principle i could read separate real and imaginary values corresponding to different addresses very unlikely that i would ever do anything of that sort so in practice what is usually done is there is something called a data pack directive that you can give to the uh, HLS tool which will basically combine the real and imaginary together into one 32 bit value why is that good because it reduces some complexity you don't need two addresses you don't need two write enable and read enable signals and so on okay the interesting thing over here is when you look at the addresses that are generated right if you can make out that blue value that is written over there right effectively what what you can notice over here is the order in which the data are being read back are or uh, are being read is 0 followed by 16 followed by 8 followed by 24 followed by 4 why that's the bit reversed addressing because the first block itself is doing bit reversal right so effectively what is happening over here is the very first block is doing bit reversed read okay which means that 
the way that it gets implemented is the addresses going out for the very first set of reads itself are in bit reversed order. So it gets the data back in this format, right? What you can do with this other signal, the imaginary signal for example is, you can right click on it. There is an option over here that allows you to change the radix, okay? You can set it to real and basically say it is fixed point signed with the binary point at 8, okay? And if you look more closely at the data at that point, it basically starts telling you that these values are actually, you know, for example, 0 0.05, 1.015, minus 0 0.89, minus 0 0.60. You correlate that with the input text file that we gave, they match exactly with those values. Okay. Zoom out fully. Let's look at the big picture. You will see this clump of activity at the left side inactivity for a long period of time, again a clump of activity, right? So what's happening over here? Basically what is happening is that clump of activity on the left hand side is where the FFT module that you have created is reading data from the test bench, okay? <coughs> How long does it take? You can sort of, you know, put markers at the beginning and at the end of that and you should see that it takes probably 96 clock cycles, right? Basically corresponding to how much time the bit reversal is going to take to read all the values, okay? After that, it is sitting idle for, well, it looks like nothing is happening for a long time. And then suddenly it starts reading data again. Why? The best way to understand that is go look at the outputs. You will see that this region over here corresponds to the part where the outputs are now being generated. Okay, so it got all the inputs, did something during which time neither inputs nor outputs were being affected and then finally started generating outputs. Okay, the outputs also sort of take a similar pattern, the write enable and the chip enable and the addresses, all of those you can look at them and see exactly the patterns and the values that are coming out. Okay, and compare them with what you expect from your C code and make sure everything matches. Right. And the interesting thing over here, of course, is as soon as all the outputs have been generated, we are ready to start reading the next set of inputs. Okay. So effectively what is happening is this test bench is going into a cyclic mode of operation. It basically reads in the next set of values as soon as the first has completed. Why does it do that? It doesn't really need to do it, but it helps. We'll look at why a moment later. The other interesting set of signals is this third row here which is called block level IO handshake. Let's open that and see what it is. You can essentially see that there are four signals over here. The first one is AP underscore start. Okay. What that means is the test bench is going to give a start signal to your FFT module after a certain amount of time. Then there is a done signal which the FFT module should return after it has completed operation. There is an idle signal which basically as long as it is one it means that the core is not doing anything it's ready to do some you know you can basically try and give it new inputs and the ready signal which is once again indicative of whether the core is ready to accept new data okay so let's zoom in a little bit on the left hand side what we find is soon after the reset has been removed right the start signal goes high as soon as the start signal goes high, the idle signal goes low. Okay, computation starts. The done signal is low at this point, it is zero. And the ready signal is also zero, basically meaning that it is not really ready to accept any new data at this point. Now this ready signal can be a little confusing. How did I give a start signal without seeing a ready signal equal to one, right? If you look at how it gets implemented, then it turns out that the ready signal sometimes comes only as a response to the start or the valid signal from the other side. So in some cases, this can be a little confusing. To understand it properly, you will have to go back and look at the Verilog code to make sure it's doing the right thing. Let's go all the way to this point out here. What's happening is after a significant amount of time, the done and the ready signal both become one. Okay. For how long? Just for one clock cycle. So effectively it is one state where the done and ready signal basically say, okay, going high 
and after that because this test bench is set up in such a way that as soon as it sees a done signal it will start the next set of data the done and ready signal go back low again you will notice that the start signal was kept high throughout i didn't sort of give it a pulse and then bring it down again because the standard operating procedure for these modules is if i leave the start signal high and once i have started operation i have anyway got out of that initial state so i'm never going to look at the start signal again until i'm back in that initial state so if you do make the start signal high and leave it high all that it means is after it has finished one computation when it goes back to the init state it will immediately start doing the computation again right so in a lot of cases you will find that it makes sense to just connect the start signal permanently to high end let the data flow through as and when it is ready okay you can measure these values right once again i would encourage you to go and try that out find out the clock cycle number at which the done signal became high compare it with the clock cycle at which the start signal was made high that difference in clock cycles is your latency okay that plus 1 is your initiation interval okay all right so far so good i am going to close this uh, but just for completeness i also want to show you another variant of the same design where i have made a couple of optimizations right like i told you i'm not telling you what the optimizations are it's just things that you can probably figure out and anyway we'll be discussing later the interesting thing is now look at the time period the interval is 21 clock cycles so from 511 we have managed to bring it down to essentially 20 clock cycles okay which means that this is a 32 point fft core every 20 clock cycles i can start giving it new data it doesn't even require 32 cycles to read the data so effectively that must mean that it is going to read at least two values per clock cycle otherwise it can't you know even read the data within 20 clock cycles okay but with every 20 clock cycles i can give it a new block of 32 values right and it has a latency of 83 clock cycles as estimated by the tool over here okay now one thing that you will see is i ran the co simulation for this the co simulation gives me slightly different numbers it shows that the interval over there is 20 not the 21 that the synthesis estimate told us and the latency is 124 not 83 okay why these differences because the co simulation is exactly actually implementing the memory block and so on and measuring the difference between start and done signals whereas the other one is just sort of estimating based on what are the delays of each individual module and adding it up there could be errors in how it is estimating it usually not much so you don't need to worry about that typically what happens if you open the waveform for this i am just going to show you the block level handshaking signals alone because they are illustrative right without really worrying about the rest of the you can look into the rest of the signals by yourselves design top signals block level io handshake ap start the start signal is sent high and remains high throughout the idle signal goes low soon after the reset is removed and just remains zero for the rest of our simulation what is interesting is now the ready and the done signals are behaving differently okay so first things first the ready signal that you can see over here there are a number of spikes in it if you measure the difference between this time and where the first start signal was given 20 clock cycles so that is your initiation interval okay and it pretty much it's sometimes 20 sometimes 21 you know it sort of varies a little bit based on what all the other handshaking signals are uh, going through but for the most part it is fairly consistent okay where is our done signal here it is okay so the difference between the done signal and the start signal corresponds to 124 clock cycles that is where it got the measured latency from okay and you can sort of see that 20 plus 25 times over here plus something else this is around 124 clock cycles okay 
So the way that the test bench works is because you had only given it one FFT call, it still puts it in a loop until it is able to at least measure the one done signal. Okay. So if for whatever reason your Verilog code hangs and is not terminating, not generating a done signal, your simulation will go into an endless loop. Right? So there can be situations where you actually end up not crashing even, but just sort of sitting there simulating endlessly. Okay. So those are all things that you need to be aware of and catch if necessary. But this sort of very clearly indicates the difference between latency and the pipeline initiation interval also. <coughs> all right. So the next thing that I'm going to do now is to go in briefly into how you would interface this with hardware. Okay. So I already sort of gave a brief picture for what we are looking at. I have a CPU. There is something that I'm going to call a bus. Right? And what exactly is this bus? Is it just a collection of wires or is it something more than that? That's actually something that we will need to spend a little bit more time on later. Okay. But for the time being, all that we care about is it's the way by which we connect things together. Okay. On the other side of the bus is some memory. Right. So for example, the board that we will be using for our testing is something called the Z board, which is based on the Xilinx Zinc processor. Okay. So for the Z board, this is an ARM processor. Okay. The same kind of ARM processor that you most of you have in your mobile phones, right? A variant of that. The memory that is available to this is around 512 megabytes. Quite a decent amount of memory, much more than the on chip block RAM that is available inside the FPGA. Okay. But what that means is this is some kind of DRAM, dynamic RAM, just like you find in a PC. DRAM has a number of advantages, the main advantage being high density. You can get a significant amount of DRAM very cheaply in a small amount of space. The biggest disadvantage is high latency. Another related disadvantage is the fact that it is dynamic, meaning that it can decay and lose information if you do not keep refreshing it. Okay. So net result is DRAM is problematic. It's not a very, you know, easy to analyze kind of memory. You can't just say I give it an address one cycle later, it gives me back the data. It doesn't work that way. Okay. But I can have 512 MB of DRAM. I can't even think of having 512 MB of SRAM in some, in a design of this sort. Now, what's interesting from our point of view is we finally want to implement our FFT as some kind of a hardware accelerator, which will also then be connected to this bus. So I'm just going to call it a HA, a hardware accelerator. Okay. Now the question is the CPU needs to be able to communicate with everything on the right hand side. Let's say that I want to read something from a memory location. What would I do? I have an address bus and some kind of a write enable or read enable signal. If I want to read something from memory, I would put the pointer value, the address from which I want to read onto the address bus and activate the chip enable signal. Okay. So the address would go from here. I would also probably have some kind of a read write <coughs> enable signal. Probably can't read what I've written over there. Right? And for simplicity, we will think of it as there is a data. <coughs> right? W data and another 
our data which is the read value which is coming back from the bus okay so the interface between the cpu and the bus is there is an address there is a read write signal there is a w data if i want to write data into the bus and a read data if i want to read data back from the bus remember i am talking about from the bus i am not talking about specifically memory okay why am i doing that because what i can then think of is that my overall memory module is mapped into something that i will call an address space okay now an address space is essentially all the possible addresses that can be generated on the address bus okay for a 32 bit address bus that essentially goes from 0 hex right i'm going to drop this h as we move forward keep in mind that any time i'm writing an address invariably i mean hexadecimal because programmers typically think more easily in hexadecimal it's much easier to understand an address space when we are talking about hexadecimal why because it makes a lot of the sort of sub memory calculations etc a lot easier okay so in general when i'm talking about memory blocks it's going to be in hexadecimal right it starts from 0 and for a 32 bit bus the highest possible address is all ifs right of course there is also the question of whether the 32 bit address value is being treated as signed or unsigned etc it doesn't matter right what is interesting over here is this 512 mb of dram that i have is obviously not occupying this entire 32 bit address space because 32 bits corresponds to 4 billion elements right 4 gig locations right whereas i am talking about only 512 m locations so what i can do is i can take this and map it into some portion of my actual address space right so this corresponds to so called physical memory right in other words if i try accessing if i have a pointer and the value that i give that pointer is some number which lies between these two values it corresponds to something which is in the actual physical memory of the system right what i can do therefore is what happens to all the other memory locations right now nothing if the cpu tries to read from some memory location which is outside of the physical range it will probably result in something called a bus error right where the operating system will basically say i don't know what to do with this right or if there is no operating system if you are lucky you will just return without any meaningful data if you are unlucky the system will crash okay but what that means is there are now a whole lot of addresses that don't have any physical meaning what i'll do is i will take some of them and map this hardware accelerator on to that okay so what does that mean when you go through the process of actually creating a module in vivado which is next right we will find that the numbers that are assigned over here are typically something like this there will be some 4 followed by all zeros and some upper limit which is again this 4000 followed by let's say fffff okay effectively what it's saying is any address in this range 4000 up to 4000 fffff corresponds to this particular hardware accelerator if i had another hardware accelerator it would go into another range of the memory okay now what happens let's say that the cpu generates the bus address right the address which is given to the bus is 4000000 okay what should i do with it i can't really read anything from that memory location directly but the bus can now figure out that okay this particular thing corresponds to where this hardware accelerator has been connected okay 
but the hardware accelerator by itself doesn't need to have all the 32 bits of the address it doesn't have a 32 bit address space the hardware accelerator has been designed with according to what i've drawn over here this is only a 16 bit address right because it corresponds to 0000, 0, 0, 0 up to fffff right that's 16 bits of address so the bus can basically remove the first 16 bits once it decodes the first 16 bits to be 4000 0, 0, 0, it will remove those first 16 bits send the rem remaining 16 bits to the hardware accelerator along with a select signal that says you are up respond basically a chip enable signal okay that is what happens in practice right the bus takes care of decoding the hardware address and sending a subset of that address to the hardware accelerator okay what's the advantage of that once this hardware accelerator receives that smaller address which is the 16 bit address it need not be 16 bit it could be like 1 bit 2 bit I can choose how many bits I want for the hardware accelerator right only that many bits will be sent from the bus to the hardware accelerator the hardware accelerator then just has to look at those decide what to do with it and respond accordingly right and that is actually interesting now the hardware accelerator can respond in any way that you like because you can write logic over there a memory has a very specific way of responding if i give it an address it has to go look in that particular location and give me back what was written there but a general hardware accelerator can behave in any way that you like you give it an address it can decide oh you want to get some flag or you want to get some the value of some register or you want to know the value of some counter i'll take that value from whatever i have available to me and give it back to you okay that is ultimately how the fft module and other such hardware accelerators are going to get interfaced with the system that you are creating okay all right we'll stop here now tomorrow what we are going to do is look at putting this together into a system right so we'll basically create one small hardware system that consists of the arm processor some memory one particular hardware accelerator do some timing test to find out how long a module takes to operate and then how do I basically write some code which will allow me to write or read something from that hardware module that I have created and get back meaningful values okay and in Friday's class we'll basically discuss possible sample projects but in the meantime of course like I said if you have any other ideas of your own make sure you follow up on those okay all right